What's happening, folks? Geologist Philip Prince uh, going to do a video about McDowell County, North Carolina, and it's uh, Helene Impacts. A lot of folks asked about Buck Creek, uh, the creek that Highway 80 goes up. Actually looking out over it here, and if you can see these uh, satellite imagery overlays in the background, uh, there's a big streak going across those, and, and that wasn't there before the storm. Uh, that's what Buck Creek looks like after the storm. Devastating impacts there. Uh, and, and ones that are are very notable uh, within the impacts, you know, that happen anywhere in Western North Carolina with this storm. Um, in this video, I want to I want to talk about what you know what the land looks like in in McDowell County. That's been a theme of these videos, uh, just in terms of of how the mountains caused this storm to produce some of the effects that it did, uh, and what you're seeing right now with you know with the colored elevation map there. Um, th this is this is rough country. Uh, Highway 80 goes up Buck Creek. I'll actually try to, to roughly draw that in here. Uh, it sort of uses the, the Buck Creek Valley, something like you see here, and you have a bunch of switchbacks up at the top. Uh, and that's actually how the, the highway takes you from the valley over here that Interstate 40 is in, Old Fort's in, uh, and, and can get you, you know, up into Yancey County uh, up here on the other side of the Blue Ridge Escarpment, which I'll, I'll label there as the BRE, right? So when you're when you're going up those crazy switchbacks, uh, which I've sketched in as, as best I can there on Highway 80, get car sick even if you're driving the car. I, that's one of the curviest roads I've ever been on. You're going up the Blue Ridge Escarpment. That's that's why it's so curvy. It's the only way to get a road up that steep terrain. Uh, and get it from the lower elevations down there in the Piedmont through that really rough country uh, up on there to the uh, to the higher Blue Ridge, right? So that Blue Ridge escarpment has been a theme that I have talked about quite a bit uh, in these videos. And of course, that's because uh, it combined with the weather during the week leading up to Helene, and of course, during Helene's, Helene's passage itself, uh, which was kind of the final punch of rainfall, to produce uh, such a extreme amount of water falling on the landscape so quickly that caused runoff flooding uh, and of course the really bad landslides and particularly the debris flows which is what we're going to we're going to talk about here uh, if you haven't seen some of the other videos at this point uh, pretty typical to see me draw something like this where i illustrate how moist air came up out of the Piedmont, pushed up over topography 2,000 feet. More than that, in many cases, the white back here, you got Mount Mitchell, the air from down in Old Fort has to has to rise literally a mile to go to go up and over Mount Mitchell. So that that rise in elevation of the air masses causes them to expand and cool. That rings as much rainfall out of them as possible. Uh, and that makes what is already a high precipitation weather system one of even higher and, and downright extreme rainfall, right? So when you got that extreme rainfall going on, it's going to run off across the landscape and sort of how the landscape is set up, uh, the way it's sloped, how densely packed the little stream channels are, things like that. That's all going to impact what, uh, what the consequences of that rain are going to be like. Uh, and as you zoom in here, Looking in the Buck Creek Valley, um, rough. Rough is the word. Uh, I worked a lot up in this area, actually, uh, right up until the the months before the storm. Um, I don't know. Are you typically a hat wearing kind of guy? Today, I actually wore a Piggly Wiggly hat from the old Fort Piggly Wiggly. Used to be frisbees. Um, bought this thing back in the spring. We were working. Uh, I guess working up off of uh, up off of Curtis Creek. Uh, area or Jarrett Creek area at that time, but uh, spent a lot of time on the ground uh, in this part of the world over the last year and a half or so. Uh, and I can personally tell you that it is it is some of the roughest escarpment topography that you're going to find anywhere along the length of the Blue Ridge Escarpment. And you can see very well how rugged it is looking at this uh, looking at this elevation overlay here, right? So. I guess the 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 point of the video uh, and what was requested specifically uh, was folk, folks wanting to understand exactly what went on uh, in in Buck Creek itself. We caught a glimpse of it there at the beginning of the video. 
uh, Buck Creek is coming down sort of like that and we'll uh we'll draft 80 in there again roughly this is kind of the best the best highway 80 that i'm able to do because uh you know if you know it it's as rough as they get there's those switchbacks going across and you'd have the parkway you know kind of coming across the crest of the blue ridge like that buck creek itself absolutely devastated uh, anyone that flew over uh this area commented on you know what what things look like there at, uh, at, at Buck Creek. So we'll, we'll fade that overlay, uh, and actually look at now the satellite imagery, uh, from after the event and got a lot of these things loaded up here. So it's taken them a little while to, to buffer, uh, see these, these scars here in the landscape. This is where debris flows started followed these hollows down slope. You know, they, they would go down, they'd be little stream valleys that hollow would have, uh, it would have flowing water in it. Um, when it carries a debris flow, of course, it has several feet of boulders, mud, trees, whatever coming down it. And these two uh, ultimately made their way down the, the Buck Creek Valley, like you see here, and traveled a huge, tremendous, tremendous distance, um, about, about two miles or so. Uh, and the bad thing here was this flow had plenty of destructive power uh, when it actually got down in the vicinity of what I think is a, it's like a trout farm there uh, on on Buck Creek down below 80, and it's it's my understanding, and I don't I don't know that for sure, but it's my understanding that um, there was at least one fatality uh, associated with the debris flow in that location. If we zoom in here bit by bit, uh, we can actually look down on some of those structures and where they used to be. Uh, and this is uh, like in all of these videos, you know, this is one of those things that's is bad to look at because you can see very clearly. Got like a red roof there. You can see these sort of roads with with houses. Um, I don't know if there's cabins or something like that down there. Um, if we bring the, the debris flow imagery in. It runs, you know, it runs right across those. And when you think about what. A debris flow is carrying um, boulders, mud, rocks uh, moving up to, you know, 30, 40 miles an hour, even faster in some locations, probably moving slower at this point because it's uh, it, it's getting into a little bit flatter part of the stream valley. I mean, Buck Creek is absolutely a creek at, at this point, but the debris flow still had plenty of, of energy to move through there. And with all that mass, I mean, it's it, it's going to literally scour everything out of the valley uh in front of it and gonna have to do the the usual kind of diagram thing and that's that's the idea that i want to want to try to communicate with this one because talked a lot about where these things happen in the landscape uh, but what they actually do to the land um is is another question uh honeycutt's videos show that really well um he's like uh, a few of these debris flows and if you watch those videos uh he's walking up just this the scoured, scoured out, I mean, a channel you want to call it, but it's, it's unrecognizable compared to what you would expect of a normal little, little mountain stream. And it's that idea of, of removing, of removing material, the debris flows, scrapes all that up and, and pushes it out and pushes it uh, down the channel down to, to lower elevation. So when you see this dark streak in the landscape here, um, I shouldn't call it dark. It's it's light colored. It's it's a, a soil, soil colored streak in the landscape. That's because that's what you're seeing. The reason it's not green is all the vegetation is gone. It's been scoured away. And this this isn't mud that has been deposited on the landscape here. This is like the scar. Um it's it's an area where what was the land surface has been has been scraped away by the debris flow. Um so when when you're looking at this imagery, at this satellite imagery, and you're seeing um, all of these, you can see a couple big ones up on the uh, up on the Blue Ridge Parkway up here in the background. When you're when you're seeing those those brown areas, that's again, it's not mud that's put there. It's it's material that's gone. It's it's soil that's gone. It's soil that's been exposed by having all the vegetation and everything under the vegetation for a few feet, you know, pushed pushed away. Uh, so I'll um we'll set up a 
set up an illustration of that now uh, before we go any further, uh, kind of give you what the idea looks like diagrammatically. And I would encourage you to check out the uh, the Mark Honeycutt videos to show what this actually looks like from the ground, because it puts a lot of it in context uh, and keep trying to emphasize in these videos. It's this, this is about the most destructive thing that can happen in the, in the Appalachians or, or anywhere for that matter. The amount of material that moves with the debris flow uh, is absolutely exceptional. And you have to remind yourself uh, just how much rock weighs and, and a debris flow is like a, basically a river of rock and, and trees uh, coming across a particular location. So we'll draft that up uh, and then we'll come back here and take a look at the maps. Hang on just a minute. Okay, so the destructive power of debris flows and the way that they do genuinely change parts of the landscape uh, is, is all because of what what they transport or, or what they carry. Uh, and, and it's sort of like water, uh, you know, that might be flowing in a in a stream or a river, but it's a little bit different in the, the fact that saturated soil is involved with the debris flow. Uh, it's it's quite a dense fluid and it actually gives the debris flow a better uh, a better capability to move big heavy things uh, like a bunch of gigantic boulders that's a, a comment that has been fairly common uh, from people who witness particularly the after effects of of some of the debris flows that occurred with with Helene uh, is just the size of a boulder that that moved along with them uh, you don't want to be hit by that of course in any situation and when it's moving with considerable speed uh, again it's it's one of the most destructive forces in in a setting like you know like the the apple uh, so what we're going to try to show here is almost like looking you know looking at that kind of thing at at, at various scales um similar what we got going here to uh to what you've probably seen a few times here on this channel and uh a, a lot of what i do is just trying to to capture sort of what the you know what the topography looks like with this this sequence of of hollows where material collects where water drains uh and the, you know the spurs or ridges between them and if we add a water course onto this uh, as we've done plenty of times here in recent days or weeks see something like that uh and you know you can have some little tributaries as well coming out of some of these hollows here. And we'll try to emphasize uh, kind of these these spur ridges coming down, and and this uh, pretty large number of of almost kind of like you know, kind of like ribs, if you want to call it that, uh, separating the, the various hollows here. That's that's something that you get in the gallon in particular. That's uh, the idea of of drainage density. It means there's a lot of there's a lot of little little stream channels and, and stream valleys in the landscape, right? Let's zoom in on this. Um, and in fact, zoom in quite a bit. Uh, been talking big picture a lot in, in these other videos. What are you going to see along, along the stream channel? I'm going to have to tilt the screen a bunch. You probably don't get a light, uh, in the background there, but it'll be over soon enough. Um, along this tiny little stream. And this, you know, this is something that you could hop rocks across or something like that. Small, small drainage channel right here. Um, boulders all over the place, uh, a lot of material down along the stream channel. Some of these may be quite large. Um, what would be underfoot otherwise, be, you know, some little cobble, cobble sized rocks and things like that. Uh, you'd probably see little, you know, little rapids in the little rapids in the stream there. Um, but again, small, small is the word. Uh, and due to that size, it's the kind of place that you know, you might consider putting a structure or two because it is absolutely beautiful. I mean, this is this is a great place to be, um, and this is where you know people people would want to to try to have access to a setting a setting like this. Everything about it is inviting, uh, and you could never imagine something uh, as small as this stream, even in the worst flood. You know, causing causing any kind of a large scale problem to a building uh, to a building right next to it. Uh, and that, you know, that's where the, that's where the danger lies, uh, with, with debris flows. So we'll illustrate now sort of the debris flows context in the landscape. Um, it's going to start up in, in one of these hollows up here, if we can get the pencil to pick up there and it's going to start making its way down following the flow path of the water, because it's behaving like a fluid, um, 
fluid in the sense that it, you know, that it, that it spreads and moves with gravity, but you know, it's, it's an extremely dense fluid and I river river of boulders is the best way to, to describe it. Every tree that in its, that's in its way is going to get picked up and, and carried along. So there's even more mass and even more dangerous objects moving with it then. And it's going to flow uh, as long as it has uh, enough slope and enough energy to keep everything in it sort of jumbled around. When it loses that energy, it's going to start to uh, to deposit material and you're going to end up with this huge pile of stuff. It's kind of sprayed out into the valley there uh, and it's going to be really sloppy and, and, and mucky and disordered for quite a period of time. Difficult to work in, uh, difficult for search and rescue to be involved in. One of the many problems with, you know, with dealing with a, with a natural disaster like this. So if we zoom back in, uh, you'll notice that the debris flow track is, is much, much bigger than the, the little stream channel that used to be there. Uh, so everything that was previously uh, along that stream, uh, it's, it's gone now. It's been, it's been swept away. And you're going to have, you know, sort of this deep scoured out track that's that's left behind. Uh, and this can be several feet, several feet deep at its deepest in the middle. Uh, and that's why I say you should check out some of the uh, some of the Mark Honeycutt videos, because you'll see what that what that actually looks like in person. And then down here where the, the material is depositing, you know, you're going to have these sort of convex almost lobes of uh lobes of accumulated debris so where where material is piling up that's going to be a that's going to be an addition of material to the landscape but but higher up here where it's scoured material is is now very much gone from the landscape and that scour is going to continue all the way up to where uh, to where this debris flow started in the landscape, and if we were to add any other, you know, kind of details to the setting from which this happened, like I've done in in some of the other drawings, you know, we might darken that up just a little bit. We might add some indication up here, you know, that there might be bedrock, kind of cliffs or outcrops or something up here in this highest roughest topography, and those are what the pieces of rock are falling off of that, that pile up, up in these hollows, that kind of piled up material is what initially slides to actually start the debris flow. And when material saturated, it, it turns into a, it turns into a chain reaction, right? So after this has gone on, there's still going to be a, a stream there, but it's going to be running, you know, kind of down the very bottom of this awful, ugly, you know, scoured out looking, scoured out looking track down the, uh, down the landscape. So in that regard, yes. Um, you know, this is literally a, a mountainside scarring event, but the material that it's moving wasn't, it wasn't bedrock. It was material sort of accumulated in the, in the stream channel. If you zoomed in on that. So let's say we, we want to give ourselves like a, like a kind of a detailed image here. I'm going to need to Maybe zoom in to do this here a little bit. We'll, we'll to draw our detail something like this. We'll have our stream channel. This is going to be before the debris flow happens. Okay. Something like that. So we'll color in what's going to be rock down there. Uh, we're going to have kind of like a soil horizon here on top of it. Need a different color for that. There we go. Um, we'll add some flowing water now. Like that and, you know, a few of the boulders that are, uh, you know, that are accumulated along the channel here. And it's important to remember that, uh, you know, that down underneath the stream, you know, this, this soil that's going to be mobilized, this is, uh, you know, accumulated rocks and, and boulders and things like that. Okay. So we'll draft that in. Okay. When the debris flow comes through here, um, big, big changes. It's, it's getting rid of a lot of this, uh, scouring it all out and just adding it, you know, to the material that it's, uh, that it's transporting. So if we were to, 
going to redraw this after the debris flow happens, what you're going to end up seeing is something like that. And you know, it's going to be this, it's kind of like kind of steep sided scoured out area. And it might have even a, even kind of a tighter little scoured area where the water uh, is, is still flowing. So that's what the uh, that's what the new landscape is is going to look like, and that is what you're seeing when you look down at that satellite imagery and you you see that soil colored streak across the landscape. That's that's it. Um, that's it in the in the areas where there's steepness on the landscape, and then down at the bottom of the flow where it starts to run out of steam and deposit. Uh, you'll see that soil colored signature there, but that is, you know, that is after it has, has progressed beyond its, its scouring period. So the, uh, the, the drawing over here on the right, um, keep saying it, but it's, it's a remarkable resource. Check out the, uh, check out the Honeycutt hikes, uh, and you will, uh, hopefully be able to see exactly what, um, what I'm trying to communicate there. Right. So thinking about these events, their destructive power, uh, do they happen all the time? No. Drought years, you probably don't have a single one in Western North Carolina. Really wet years, you might have several. An event like a Helene, hundreds more, who knows. Um, something to be aware of, not something to be afraid of in the sense that it's coming at you next week or something. You you know the conditions that cause it, but if you're in its way at the wrong time, you know, there's it, it's not a survivable kind of thing, right? So let's uh let's hop back to the maps here, uh, and hopefully the sketches are going to uh going to put things in a little bit more context. Okay, so so that's what you're that's what you're seeing uh, when you when you see these scars in the land, like you see along what what used to be the course of Buck Creek. Yes, there's still water flowing through this. Yes, it's still Buck Creek. Uh, it's it's changed. Okay, it's it's changed quite a bit and it's going to take it a while before it looks, you know, like it did before the storm. Now, the areas around this, you know, they're they're not they're not impacted as significantly uh, by any stretch. The ridges are still as high as they used to be. The mountains are still as high as they used to be. Uh, the the bedrock that's in the bottom of Buck Creek is probably more exposed now, uh, but it's still there. And the the elevation of the stream bed, you know, it's gone down a two or three or four feet or whatever, because material is scraped away. But, you know, but the stream is still there. Now, that being said, yes, uh, this, this is a scar that's, that's going to be in the landscape. Uh, wanted to bring in uh, actually some LIDAR imagery here real quick, um, just to show what, what this background landscape would look like. Really rough, really steep, of course, has the road grades all over it. There's those crazy switchbacks in Highway 80 going up towards the top of the mountain. Uh, and if you look at the slopes around Highway 80, they are are scarred with old landslides just because of a slope this steep. If, if it's going to have a road on it, you're going to be fighting with that road. There's not a way around it. Uh, go back to the beginning of the video. This terrain is so steep, there's not another way to to get a road up and out of here. It's just it's just not possible um, owing to the nature of the land uh, in this place. So. It, it's an area that's already prone to this type of behavior. And when you put the amount of rain that we had on top of it, uh, unfortunately, it, it's really an unavoidable outcome. Uh, if you look at where where the flows started, um, keep your eye right there on the on the top of those scars. You got one that that looks like it starts on a natural slope here. Um, actually down below the parkway. That's the parkway itself. Uh, this one, this one pretty clearly, I think from the imagery, it starts, you know, below, below the parkway. Uh, another one looks like it starts somewhere up here, right along, you know, right along the road. In either case, with the material as, as saturated as it is, uh, once that flow starts, it's sweeping up everything in its path and, and it's going to accumulate a huge amount of material, uh, as it goes downhill. You actually see in the bottom of the stream here, um, where the hand is is pointing right now, and actually try to outline that a little bit. You you can get a sense for where, you know, there's there's basically stored sediment. It's kind of this flatter area along the stream here. We'll draft the water in there. Use a darker color. And it's stored sediment like that that uh that I was trying to illustrate in the uh in the 
the Microsoft Paint image there. Um, that's the material that can be that can be you know swept up and sort of eroded by the flow and, and transported along with it. So when lidar information, lidar data are gathered um, in in this area after the storm, yeah, it's it's going to look different. Um, is a lot of the landscape going to look pretty much the same? Yes. Uh, are places that are affected by debris flows, are they going to look different? You know, ab absolutely. And this work I was doing in McDowell County was actually trying to get a sense of what landslide behavior and history has been like in, in McDowell County. Um, had no idea that, that this was going to come along. No one had ever looked at McDowell County with LIDAR imagery before. And, it you know, it's a place that that has a pretty dramatic landslide history. Um wanted to actually show what a couple of these like that a couple of these older slides look like in the landscape uh if the computer survives this much zooming around in google earth um the the scars that you know that that debris flows like this leave are are easy to see and they stick around for a while how long do they stick around we don't we don't actually know that um estimate would be you know probably for for at least many hundreds of years. Um, a lot of them are probably from the 1916 floods. Some of them might be from 1940. Um, some of them might be from other more recent floods in the, you know, the 1700s or 1800s that even, you know, aren't even documented. Uh, no one, no one knows that for sure, but, but you can see, you can see scars in the landscape. Uh, and this is an interesting area to look at. This is, a. Uh, this is up off Newberry Creek. Uh, you can see a nice debris flow scar right there. Uh, I have an idea that this one did not did not have a bad outcome for anybody because it's pretty far up there. I hope that's the case. Um, it, it's pretty good size and it would have delivered its material down there to Newberry Creek. So we'll zoom in a little bit more here. I'll bring that scar in one last time. Okay. See it up there. So keep your eye on that spot. So there's going to be a big divot right there in, in the new LIDAR. It's going to look somewhat like the scars you see right near the center of the screen here. Um, zoom in on those. So these are old, old debris flow initiation points and they have scoured this channel out on its on its way downhill, sort of in the way that I, you know, I tried to illustrate for you there. How old are those? How long have they been in the landscape? Absolutely no idea. Uh, not that long. Those might be from 1916. And if you compare the appearance of that channel with the one over here that just got a big debris flow through it, this one's more scoured out. Uh, and, and this one's probably going to look more like its neighbor after after Helene. So, yes, there are there are scars on the mountains and in the channels that that will be there after the event. But the mountains here are already full of those scars. Uh, and it's just it's just sort of a factor of how of how the land changes in this part of the world. Um, when when new lidar you know comes out, there's going to be a lot of interest in it and a lot of a lot of study of it. Um, that doesn't fix anyone's property. That doesn't bring anyone back. But it's it's all part of trying to understand what you know what might happen the next time around, and also just putting this event uh, in context. Things like this have happened in the past, undoubtedly they'll happen again. We just, you know, we don't, we don't know when. Um, and the storm uh, of course has raised plenty of questions and, and folks are going to be thinking about it for quite a while. Uh, so hope, hope this was useful, particularly to the folks that, that wanted to see what Buck Creek looked like. Um, going to try to do an overview of the rivers that were affected next. A lot of people asked for that as well. Probably should have done it already, but, uh, trying to get there. Um, as I say, in all the videos, I'm pretty, pretty busy these days. Um, doing a lot of work in Western North Carolina. So trying to get that one coming. Uh, hope you'll check it out when it comes along.